And I'd just like to take a moment to say that, you know, many weeks ago when we started these town halls, I don't think anybody would have thought that we would be sitting here today. Um, for IFA, I think this must be the 17th week that we're working from home. And for the foreseeable future, I don't think that's going to change. Because in the world today, you know, there's been 12.3 million people who have been diagnosed with COVID. And most importantly, the lives of over half a million people have been lost to COVID. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy Dupree. And she's going to be talking with us about some of those essential conversations that we could be having with our family, but also, you know, professionally. You know, Amy is an internationally renowned expert on lifestyle issues related to ageing. She has an extensive history, both academically, working in business, and it's really been about the professional experiences in working with and on behalf of older adults and their families. She's incredibly well credentialed. In March 2012, she was recognised as one of Canada's top businesswomen by Women's Post Media. In October 2016, she received a Professional Achievement Award, award from her alma mater, Case Western Reserve University. Um, Amy is often known as Dr Amy, but I know her as someone else. You know, she's a colleague, she's a friend, she's a mum, she's a partner, she's a confidant, she's a professional, and she's one of those people that is always at the end of the phone or always present to the needs of other people. Um, quote unquote, Dr Amy, as she is affectionately known, uses gerontological social work background to give practical advice. You know, what's always intrigued me about Amy is her position in industry. You know, it's very rare to have a gerontologist working in industry, and she does that, that, and she might sort of talk with you about that. And that says something to me about financial institutions and their need and thirst to know about older people. You know, but why did Amy come to this position? And I'm sure she's going to mention it, but, you know, she was a, um, a caregiver, you know, for her parents over many, many years. And so she really has not only the professional experience, but that intrinsic DNA, the DNA of being a caregiver and what it's like. So she actually melds, you know, her person, with her professional experiences. So we are very pleased to be in conversation today with Dr. Amy Dupree. Over to you, Amy. Thank you very much, Dr. Jane Barrett, who I could say as many lovely things back to you. And I appreciate that introduction. And I just wanna say hi to everyone this morning from all over the world and lovely to see some familiar faces on here. Uh, I was so pleased when Jane asked me to be part of this because this is a topic I love to talk about. It's how do we improve the quality of our conversations, the ease of our conversations, and the effectiveness of our conversations, both with families, but also as professionals. And, and Jane told you, you know, a, a bit about my professional background, but I'm so glad she mentioned about my caregiving, because for me, my passion for this topic really came out of my caregiving years. My mom had a massive stroke, and lived almost eight years after that stroke, and she was quite disabled. And my father and I became a care team for my mom, and he and I had not had an easy relationship. We hadn't had a bad relationship, it just wasn't very close and very easy. And I found that I had to learn how to work with my dad on being a good caregiver, and what we found that we shared in the beginning was a commitment to, to making sure my mom had the best quality of life possible. And it was that commitment that helped us work together to develop better communication. And over those, that, that, that time period was a, a huge gift to me uh, to be able to spend that with both my mother and my father. And he lived about three years after that. And the last decade that I had with my dad, we became very, very close and learned how to work a lot of those things through. 
And what I ended up doing was wanting to take that to other people and helping other people have those conversations and not just families, but also professionals. And what happened for me was over the years, I've, I've developed this interest, this specialty in helping people, professionals and families have more effective and easier conversations. And with professionals, and often as, as, as Jane has said, the professionals I'm working with are often in financial services or in non-human service fields, although I do do work also in human service fields and in the area of retirement residences in Canada and the US. But with financial services, I, I help them have these conversations with their clients through the lens of life transitions. And when I'm talking about life transitions, it's all the changes that people go through as they, as they age, whether it's caregiving or their own health issues or retirement, widowhood, divorce, all of those types of things. And the goal is for them to be able to connect with their clients so that they can provide better services and better advice and really hear where their clients are coming from. And I talk to them about that every transition has four implications. And I do this with families as well, because I find that when people break down the implications of the transitions, they're able to be calmer, to take a more planful approach and to not be as overwhelmed by what's happening. And so I talk about the fact there are practical implications when people go through things, there are emotional, there are family implications. And I often are talking, I'm talking about family of choice as well as biological and legal families. And then of course, there are financial and legal implications. And I help people break that down and look at what, what do they need to be focusing on in that moment? Where's the conversation needed? And then when I work with professionals, the other thing that I help them do is I teach a process to them to have these essential conversations that I've named Lyra, and it's L-E-R-A. It's very simple. My, my goal is always to simplify these things for people, not to make them more complex. So the L is for listen, the E is empathize, the R is reassure, and the A is act. And this may, this may seem so basic, but I have to tell you, I have found that professionals that I work with love this because what their inclination is when they're working with families and especially with older adults is they jump right to advice or to solving problems. And you can't have essential conversations without really hearing somebody. So the listening is really listening, not just to the content of what's going on, but to the emotion. Obviously the empathizing is responding to that, letting the person know that they're heard and understood. And then the, the reassure is a key step in this. And I have them learn how to do all of that before they jump into advice. And it's been incredibly effective for improving the quality of conversations that people have. Now with families, I take it a little different approach. They don't need Lyra, but I, I find that aging families really struggle with hearing older adults in the way that that they need to be heard. And I'm sure that this is something we can all talk about that, you know, uh, adult children who come from the best intentions, and I was one of these adult children, and, and it's only from doing this badly in the beginning with my own dad that I, I eventually learned how to do this better. But the idea I, of, of slowing down and how do you approach the conversations and have truly essential conversations with your family is something I talk about a lot. And I'll share with you something that happened in this, in this time of COVID. I was asked a couple of months ago at the very beginning of, of the impact in Canada where I live to be on a, a television show in Canada and talk about how families could talk to their aging relatives about the issues related to COVID. And when I was approached about this, I was told that by the, the producers of the show that they were sure that uh, the older adults in the community were not taking enough precautions and that, that this was a big issue. And why were these older people not doing what they should be doing? It was a very punitive tone. And so of course I came back and said, I didn't think that was an older adult issue at all. I had thought it had nothing to do with aging, but I understood that that's how their adult children were feeling. And so when I talked with the hosts of the show who are all adult children caregiving happens to be, their approach to their parents was typical to what I see a lot and I'm sure you all see a lot. 
they were very parental with their parents. They come in the room and their approach was to cite statistics about this is what is happening and you need to change your behavior and you're going out and you're not doing what you should be doing. At this point, we were kind of in a, you know, a, a stay at home totally here in Canada and they felt their parents were going out too much. And so one of the things I did was just teach them this process that works well when families are trying to have conversations. The first thing I always say is just limit the focus of the conversation and approach with sensitivity. And I say what I mean by that is start the conversation by talking with your aging parent or your aging relative, whatever that relationship is, about the fact that your goal is to support their choice, their independence, their quality of life, that that's all you're there for, that you want them to know that that's why you want to chat with them. But there's something that you feel you need to talk about. And so then I suggest that they share their feelings and their emotions before sharing the facts. I said, this is not a courtroom case, it's somebody you love. And if we could go to sharing our feelings first and why we're feeling concern, and you know, I'm scared, I'm feeling scared, I don't wanna lose you, I want you to be around for when your grandchildren are growing up. Whatever it is, something very heartfelt, it lowers people's defensiveness. And then the key part is to really seek to understand the perspective of the older adult, what's going on for them. You know, why are, if, if they truly are going out all the time when, when the, the orders are not to, what was that about? Why is it? Is it loneliness? Is it the fact that they're bored? Is it that they're feeling socially isolated? And then the, the fourth part is problem solved together. Really figure out how you can come together and figure out some solutions to this. And then the last step I teach is just set the next time you're going to talk while you're talking now. Because what I know is these conversations aren't easy to have. And if you can come back together and say, okay, in two weeks, let's, let's just chat again and see how it's going very informally. This is not a, you know, a meeting in a, in a diary. This is, uh, let's just make sure that we're going to talk about this again. So that approach about limiting the focus, approaching with sensitivity, sharing feelings first, seeking to understand the perspective of the older adult, problem solving together, and then scheduling another time, I have found gives families some guidance for how to have these conversations. Now, as I say this, I'm also aware that this is very culturally bound, and this may not work in the culture that you are in. So I don't want to make assumptions that all of us can come together and do this. The other thing I know is there are many families that can't have these conversations. We have to be open and honest about that. But my work is to help make the complex more simple, both for professionals and families as they go through this. So what I'm hoping we can do today in our conversation, I think this could be a really robust discussion that we're gonna have, is talk, that's the how. I'd love to talk with you about what are the conversations we should be having with families and where do we run into roadblocks? But also another part of this, because as, as Jane and I were talking ahead of time, we both talked about essential conversations aren't just within families, it's with us as professionals. We're going through a tough time too. How do we support each other in this? Where is it that we need a little bit more support? I, my experience during this pandemic has been that it, there, there, there certainly in the tragedies that have happened, there certainly are gifts that have come out of this. And I feel one of the gifts is that people are more open about the fact that they need authentic connection and conversation, that they're seeking this, this sense of connection with each other. And I have really watched a, a, a level of openness in my professional life that I have never seen with people talking about how tough it is and whether it's tough because they're, they're working at home and they have small children and it's very hard to manage all that, or it's tough because they're worrying about aging parents they can't see, or they're just finding it very stressful to be so isolated. I'm finding professionals that normally wouldn't share these things being very open. And I hope today we can talk about how do we support each other as well as how do we support the families that we work with in having these these conversations during these very vulnerable times. And with families, we know, I, I can, you know, I mentioned a couple of the conversations, but I think some of the, the conversations with the aging relatives and 
that people need to be having are clearly around safety and, and physical safety and health and sa physical health safety, but also mental health. And I think it's key to say that mental health is as important as physical health. And how do we help people get through these times with a sense of social support that makes this a less lonely, isolated time and a period of connection rather than isolation? So I'm going to stop there, and, and Dr. Barrett, I'm going to turn it back to you now. Thanks, Amy, and you can just leave the doctor out of it for a minute, and we can, okay. we can, we can, we can just be friends. Um, okay. while, while we're, and you've really given us a challenge. This is a discussion, right? Yeah. But I do want to pose a question, and that really is around visitation and long-term care. There's been mm. lots of discussion in Canada, but also around the world. You know, this balance, and I know yeah. um, we have some Australian colleagues on the line, where there was pretty much a, a complete lockdown for a number of weeks, mm -hmm. you know, for safety. And those facilities were able to adjust, um, you know, using technology, etc. To, to make the connection. You know, it hasn't been so simple in, in some countries. And of course, you know, in countries like India, where Dr. Vinod Shah comes from, you know, it's, it's a completely different story. Do you have any views? Um, and it's not right or wrong, but it would be interesting to hear your views about this. About the shutdown or about how to keep the communication open? I think it's about keeping the communication yeah. open. I, and I, you know, this, and, and by the way, a little shout out to Dr. Shaw. Hi, Dr. Shaw. I, you know, I, in, in, in countries where we have good technology, I, I'm so grateful for the technology during this time period. And, and I think uh, we've seen how much it's benefited people who are isolated and in lockdown in nursing homes to, if they have an ability to FaceTime or do something, which of course not everybody can. But I think that keeping communication in whatever ways we can are so key. And there's some creative things I've seen people do in this. Um, dropping, many, many nursing homes have allowed things to be dropped off at the front door. So having a, a basket of things that get dropped off that are, that are more uh, interactive, activity-based, that also can be the part of discussions are great. Uh, I know pe some people have dropped off um, photo albums and then are on the phone talking with their parents about the photo albums that, you know, perhaps haven't been pulled out in years or finding other things that have a sense of meaning for their, their relative and using that as a basis of conversation, creating some, uh, I, I have co these conversation cards that have questions on them, having more interesting conversations than just what did you have for breakfast today? You know, what happened? Being able to really think about this is a time that maybe I, you know, often people will say they want to do a life review with their parents and they want to know what's what, what their childhood was like. This is an opportunity to be doing some of those things because we have more time. And often it's a way, again, to engage uh, someone who's in lockdown if they're able to have those conversations. Now, what I'm not talking about are people with dementia who are not able to engage in this. This is a whole other level that's very, obviously incredibly challenging about maintaining connection that way. But for people who are able to actually have the conversations, there's an opportunity in this lockdown period to do some of the things that we have not had the time to do in the past. And I think there's a recognition that we all probably have more than ever that even when life is long, our time here is pretty short and postponing all of these things we think are important is not a great idea. And this is a chance to, to embrace that now and look at how can we engage at a different level and not just be on the phone asking the basic questions. So Amy, I'm just going to call on Sue Hindi to, to talk a little bit about um, what's happening in, a, in a, a setting that she's familiar with. And then, um, oh, guess what? We've got Kathleen Brasher as well, both Australians and, and yes. colleagues. So, um, Sue, just briefly, and then Kathleen. Sure. So, I'm on the board of Dudagala Aged Services. We have aged eight aged care facilities across the spectrum of, of uh, people's capacity. And we've been uh, 
twice now we've had to lock down a number of our facilities because of a concern that there might have been COVID in amongst it. Everyone's been tested. Thankfully, so far, no one has. But what we've done is employed extra staff to support residents to connect to their families through the glass and through the phone, teaching residents FaceTime mm -hmm. and all the different platforms. We've put in new extra phones, iPads, a number of other uh, processes and technology and written a very step-by-step -step, um, guide for families to know how to use it as well as teaching residents how to use it. So there's lots and lots of um, work gone into enabling people to use the technology and to actually connect. And so people can book in to the chat deck where there's a, some, a covered place where people can go as a family member and the resident will be brought at that time and the technology is supported. So it's a very structured, supported way of keeping residents and family connected while in lockdown. And if you could put the um, any website link, Sue, that would be great. Um, yeah. Kathleen, and then I'm going to go back to Amy and ask Amy about the importance of verbal versus non-verbal communication. So, Kathleen. Are you on mute? Yes. No, thank, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Amy. It's lovely to hear you. Um, I'm, I've been working with a group across Northeast Victoria, and we're trying to work with a process called the four M's in working with older people. So every, asking every health professional in every interaction with an older person to address what matters, their mobility, their medication, mm -hmm. and their mental health. And health professionals have told us that asking what matters, that they actually find it quite frightening to actually ask an older person, what matters to you today, either about our interaction or, you know, what are your life goals or your health goals? So I'm just wondering if you might have some tips or ideas about how we can ease their anxiety about having even a brief conversation with an older person about what matters to them. Okay. Amy? Uh, Kathleen, that is such a great quote. Do you know what their hesitancy is in doing it? What, what is it that frightens them? Do you know? Uh, I haven't actually ha had the opportunity of disentangling some of that, but it feels as if they think the answer is going to be so great that they won't be able to help or it's mm. going to take up so much of their time and they feel they've only got a small piece a small window of opportunity to work and they need to get their, their whatever they're doing, whether they're a podiatrist or a nurse or, or a general practitioner to get their tasks done. I'm so glad you brought this up. You know, this is probably the number one thing I hear from professionals uh, is if I take the time to listen, I won't get my job done. And I, 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 it's such a fascinating perspective, isn't it? To think that our jobs are somehow separated from the people with whom we're working and that we can, you know, treat them as though they're 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 not actually there with us. And I I always I I say to professionals actually when you practice this, it doesn't actually take more time. It's about shifting the lens that you work with people, you know, through the lens through that you work with people. So it's not about that this is suddenly you're going to have to solve all their problems. And I I hear that fear, Kathleen, that they're afraid. What if I can't fix this? What if I can't deliver what this person wants? And I think one of the messages that I always say is that one of the greatest human needs is to feel heard, seen, and understood. And that doesn't mean we have to fix everything, but just to know that somebody heard you and acknowledged that, I believe is one of the greatest gifts we give each other. And we get so little of that in our lives, if you think about, you know, and think about older adults living in a residence, how little they get truly heard, seen, and understood. So I think if, if you can work with those professionals to ch help them shift their perspective that their goal isn't to necessarily be able to deliver all of those things, but it's to truly be there as a presence to listen, to hear, and then to say, if you can't deliver something, I, I'm, I wish that I could make all of that happen for you. I can't, but here's what I can do. And here's what maybe we can do together. 
And then also, obviously, if there are other people who could be pulled in to help with some of that, great. But being heard and knowing somebody cares what you want and what's important to you is the real gift in this. It's not the fixing all of those things. So I think that's the different perspective on that. Okay, thanks, Amy. We've got three three other people coming forward. Um, Anne-Marie Felton, um, Eileen from University of Third Age, and then Vinod Kumar. So Anne-Marie, welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to see you all, and particularly you, uh, for, for, uh, for Jane, for your for chairing this meeting. Uh, I had a question. It, it, it's, it's very UK centric, so forgive me for that. But um, as the lockdown um, is being gradually lifted, there is emerging um, that many of the older people are afraid still to re-engage. They don't like being locked down. Mm -hmm. They want to get out, but there is fear. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a problem. And I also think in relation to the healthcare professionals who are engaged with them, they too have an anxiety in, in relation to this and how best to deal with the, the, the fear that is being expressed. And I think, think as Dr. Amy has already uh, enunciated, we need to listen. We may not have the answer. Mm -hmm. And um, for many healthcare professionals, it's, it's often, let's find a solution. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes there may not be a solution, but listening helps. Now, it's easy for me to say that. I'm not doing it. But uh, I think it is something we need to really attend to. And with regard to people who, who suffer from dementia, remember, they may not always be older people. Um, dementia can afflict uh, at a much earlier age and so this is hugely demanding and uh, there is emerging uh, because of the complete lockdown that the, 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 the general uh, progress of people with dementia is infinitely worse during this period and um, there is now a suggestion that named family members would be described as um, uh, carers and therefore they would be permitted to 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 visit their relatives and so on now this is this is one of the discussions that are t is taking place but in the meantime the the lives of people with this condition just their quality of life gets worse and it, it's 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 it is difficult thank you for listening okay thanks Anne Marie um, we'll go to Eileen and Vinod and then come back to you Amy for the three so, Eileen. Uh, thank you very much, Jane, for taking my question. And thank you for an excellent <clears throat> prompter on the conversations during this transition. What I'm asking the question is, how do you do individuals who have relatives who are in long-term settings, who have been isolated and are no longer accepting visitors, that when you go back to visit them, the individual visiting is suddenly faced with a person who looks fantastic, who is relating more to the people in the long-term facility. And it takes a while then both for the individual to make connection and to be happy with the fact and comfortable. they mixed emotions knowing that they're, they're looking great. So mm -hmm. down the track, the, you know, it is good to know, but in, in the immediacy. Mm -hmm. So that level of anxiety. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Eileen. And Vinod Kumar? Vinod, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay. My comment and question is that there are quite many old age facilities where, which are quite distant from the places where their families live. And some of these elder people are chronically cognitively impaired like patients with dementia and some become sick very recently while in these facilities and they get temporarily cognitively impaired. Now what kind of technological uh, methods one can apply to keep in touch with such relatives in distant old age facilities, either directly with the peop older people or through their caregivers, in, to, in order to ensure Lira, as have be, has been 
described just now. Thank you. Okay. Back, back to you, Amy, starting with uh, Anne-Marie's comments and question. Well, it's interesting. Anne-Marie, I, I so appreciate what you said, and I there aren't easy solutions to that, of, of course, but I, and, and I liked when you said listening helps, but it's easy for us to say that, right, when we're in, in here having the conversation. But I do think bringing these issues out in the open, I think so many of us are struggling with uh, deep fears during this time. And the ability to be able to talk about that and have someone listen to that and not, we can't always take away people's fears, but we can at least engage in some support and conversation and then look at how we take small steps so that people don't get stuck in isolation because they're so afraid. You know, what, what are the, I always say you don't, uh, this is a very culturally bound thing I'm about to say, but you don't have to jump off the high dive of the swimming pool. You can stick your toe in the water, right? And so what, what is the way to stick your toe in the water? And, and what I know is as people move forward with practical solutions to coming out of isolation and their fear, they need that social support at the same time. They need to feel there's somebody there listening to them who cares. And I love that you talked about the fact the workers are afraid too. And it's, I think that's so hard for workers who feel that they're supposed to be brave during this time. That's where, you know, back to the conversation I said at the beginning, how do we support each other during this to make sure that we can get through this with, with fewer mental health scars at the end of this, I think is a key thing to be thinking about. So and thank you for those comments. No solutions either, Anne-Marie, I'm sorry, but though, that's just perspective on that too. <laughs> And Eileen's question, Amy? Eileen's question around, uh, okay, I need a refresher now. I lost my, I lost the question, I'm sorry. That's all right. I will, yeah. yeah, off you go, Eileen. Uh, when, when people visit their relatives in long-term settings, they suddenly find that they're looking great and it oh, takes right. the part, okay? Yeah, thank you. I just needed that little refresher, thank you. Uh, this is a hard one, isn't it? Because people, uh, you know, it kicks up so much emotion when you go visit your family member and, and they're not connected to you and they look wonderful and you think, you know, how do I fit in all of this? There's almost a feeling of abandonment that the family member feels from the older adult. And, and again, I'm, I, I think that idea of being able to express that is so important. And, and Logically, most people get that in the long term, this is a good situation, and it doesn't mean that this person isn't going to reconnect. But I think there, there are practical things that people can do to start that reconnection process as well, you know, and, and that's very individual, so I can't give an overall statement on that. But I think being able to talk about the hard parts of watching your relative uh, connect with someone other than you. There was a movie actually done about this a number of years ago. Uh, I think it was called a Away From Her. And the, someone had to place their relative for, with dementia in a nursing home and it was, a, it was a, a, a spouse. And then that person started to fall in love with someone in the nursing home. And the mixed feelings that the spouse had watching this happening, both so happy that this person had some joy and connection, but the loss and the feeling of abandonment and all those other things. It's very complicated. We live in complicated times with this. And there's not easy solutions. Again, there are things people can do to reconnect. But I think being able to support, for the staff to be aware enough to support the family would be wonderful in that, those situations. And I think teaching staff in, in nursing homes to be aware of some of that is a really key part of this. And uh, Vinod Kuma. I, I don't feel like I'm the, the, the expert in technology around this. I, I, I certainly, you know, recommend technology and ways to, to do it, but there may be people, Jane, on the call or you who could speak to that better than me. It's certainly not me because I, <laughs> I, I can't do the, the ticker on the television. Um, but um, if anybody's um, got some ideas, please uh, put them in the chat box. Um, Lorraine Cunningham. Good question though. I don't, I, you know, I do want to say it's important and I, and I have seen technology being such a help to people and, and, you know, I keep recommending to families as much as you can utilize things where you can see the person versus just talk to them. It does certainly shift connection for the reason you brought up earlier, Jane, 
which is about body language and reading emotion and the feeling of connection we have when we see each other. As I'm on this call with all of you and I see your faces, it, it certainly creates a sense of c connection for all of us, I think, to be able to watch each other's facial expressions and look into each other's eyes. It's a different experience. Yeah, it is. Um, Vinod, if I can just respond from a personal perspective, my mother is in Australia. I'm here in Canada. So, and my mother absolutely refuses to use any technology at all, other than a telephone, right? So she refuses to see my face. Um, and so I call her three or four times a day. And that means that I'm up at three or three, three, three thirty in the morning. And sometimes the call is one minute, sometimes it's 45 minutes. You know, I'm the daughter that my mother can talk rubbish to, you know, about, about um, you know, what's going on with the royal family, um, what's going on in politics, <laughs> you know, what she's, what she's had for lunch. You know, it's, and these could be random thoughts, right? Um, Mum's mobility is incredibly poor but mum refuses to use any mobility aids whatsoever, right? Um, there is a large house. It's the first time she's lived by herself ever in her life. Dad died two years ago. So she refuses services. She refuses technology. She tells me that she hasn't heard from anybody all day. And I know that my brother and sister and several other people. And so what I've got to do is accept that that's where mum wants to be at this moment in time. So my job is to talk rubbish and to hear her voice and for her to hear mine. I did say to mum and dad a couple of years ago, why don't you, you know, do Skype? Doesn't cost anything. And the response from dad was, because then we would know that you're not here. Oh. And it was the question, why, Dad? Is it money? Is it this? Is it that? Is it? No. Nope. It would be because I know you're not here, which I think is, and it's asking that question, you know, the, yes. the why. So, you know, so all I've got is a telephone. And that's, and that's, so she hears my voice, you know, and as mums do, what's wrong? What's happened? So we do that every day. So I hope that that sort of gives you some perspective. Um, and can I just say something to that? Because I, I, there's so much in what you just said. But the one part I love, first of all, it's so real, right? It's just like in my own family, you know, these conversations were not easy. And when I talk to families about this, I always say, you know, I live in the real world and I have a family too. And I can tell you that not everyone will engage in these kind of conversations and we have to recognize that not everyone, you know, my dream is that everyone will someday plan for their own aging. <laughs> and you can mess, guess that I will not live to see that dream come true, but they, some people don't want to talk about the fact that that house no longer works for them and they don't care. And is, you know, I, I've heard through much of my, when I did home care social work, how many times I heard people say, the only way I'm leaving this place is in a box. You know, you're not getting me out of here. I don't care what happens. Um, and their family members are pulling their hair out and worried. And what I love what you said, Jane, was that your job is to just talk rubbish with her and to accept the fact that she is an adult who is cognitively okay, so she can make her own decisions. And, and oftentimes when I do caregiver workshops, I'll ask people in the room, I'll say, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but anybody in the room ever made a bad decision in your own life? And people kind of chuckle uncomfortably. And I say, well, guess what? you get the right to do that to the day you die. And you get to choose which are the decisions that are right for you. You get to live your life. And I think I, I'm a big proponent of supporting that and then supporting family members to, to have more peace of mind that like you do, Jane, you're a great example of someone who's able to accept who her mom is right now. Yeah, look, thank you. Um, let's go on to Lorraine Cunningham. Lorraine, you've got a question and comment. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for hosting it, uh, Andrea, Jane and Amy. Um, yeah, we live in Ireland, as you guys know, and 
I work with an age friendly group. And what I find is that um, a lot of them, they don't have any, any uh, technology skills at all. And even though we have tried to set up different uh, iPhone uh, classes and PC skills and learn them how to Skype, because a lot of their families are away in Canada and America and Australia and everything, but to have that link, a lot of them are, they're actually afraid of technology. And a lot of them live, even the ones who are willing to participate, a lot of them live in quite rural and they don't have any access to broadband or Wi-Fi. Mm. And the only, the only person, as I said in the, in the message was, the only person they might see in the whole week is the postman. So when this pandemic started, uh, Ireland um, gave out these postcards and we did, we got a couple of hundred of them and we sent them to everybody within our organization who was part of our different groups. And the response was amazing. A lot of them wrote back and they rang into the office to say they would received the card and that they were delighted somebody was thinking wow. of them. So even though we live in the 21st century, because Ireland in places is quite rural, a lot of Ireland is still in the 20th century. So it's how we bridge that gap and how we encourage people to move forward. And I think for people, I'm in my 60s now, I think for people like me who are well tuned into getting older and preparing, and I have a book, I write exactly what I want from my three children so they don't end up like Jane and everybody else listening to the rubbish. <laughs> I went through that with my mom and dad. I minded them. And I, for me, it's the one thing in life I don't want any of my three children to say, it's your job today, it's my job tomorrow, it's your job on Friday. I don't want to do that. So I've, I write everything down as I, I talk to all the older women. I identify very clearly. And I think when we do get back to work and we do get back to working with the older group, I will encourage them to do this as well. And I think I've if I've learned one thing out of the pandemic, I think it's to make people in your family very aware of what you would like, depending on your health and your mobility. But that, that you've taught, you know, and again, go back to the listening bit. If we all listen, we can learn what we would like and more importantly, what we don't want. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I have to say, I love talking rubbish with my mum. All right. <laughs> So I love to I love to talk about the royal family and, and politics. So it's it's um it's my word. Um I just like to um call on Jane Teasdale from Mosaic. So Jane, you're really at the front line with your work in Canada and you've got some thoughts responding to Anne Marie's question. Yes. So, yeah, go. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that are happening, I guess, within Toronto or Canada, especially about the long-term care homes. And um, prior to COVID, families were actually hiring private caregivers or families were providing a lot of the care in these long-term care homes or even retirement homes. Because as you know, you know, there isn't the funding there, um, lack of personal support workers, lack of training um, and the focus is really you know the the task the medical task and they these caregivers in these homes do not have the time to be having a, you know essential conversations as amy puts it which mm -hmm. which they actually need to mm -hmm. and and this really needs to be implemented i think going forward and i think you know down the road there will be some movement um, mm -hmm. Dr. Amy Dupree has um, uh, uh, implemented these caring cards, which are amazing, which is about essential conversation. Um, Mosaic has, uh, we give those cards actually to every new client that we have, and that integrates the personal support worker in conversations. Mosaic has taken a step forward in um, six years of developing a person-centered care approach called The Meaning of Me. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other conversation, but you can right. go to our website. There's lots of articles, but that's really key, I think, within these mm -hmm. long-term care homes and retirement homes. They're not putting enough focus on this. So I think that's an area that we need to address. Um, there is, uh, I think I noted, um, a Family Caregiver Collaborative Alliance 
Um, there's been podcasts. I was asked to speak on that about the gaps within care. Um, I think Dr. Samir Sinha, he was also presented on that conversation as well. Uh, so I think there's lots of movements. There's lots of advocacy mm -hmm. that needs to be done by families. And I think if families were trained on personal care, mm -hmm. uh, when we found that a lot of the caregivers were, uh, you know, in quarantine at the time or, you know, loss of caregivers in the field because they were anxious about working, you know, I think there were ways that we could have done that by training the family caregivers up, do, providing the PPE, doing the protocol checks and the contact tracing and um, temperature checks and COVID testing and all that kind of stuff. You would find that the families would be very, very helpful in these homes mm -hmm. if, 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 mm -hmm. if the long-term care would have them. But then again, there's a risk and there's a liability. So there's, there's lots of issues. Anyway. That's some of the uh, high points, I guess. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. We're, we're just going to go straight on to Martha Foster. Martha, would you like to come forward and ask your question to Amy? Be delighted to do so. Um, I am the chair of an organization of 80,000 retired uh, individuals from the education sector. And we have committees across the country that um, during this COVID crisis have been trying to attempt to connect with members who they felt were more isolated uh, than, I mean, everybody was isolated, but they, their concern were with more the older or the oldest of our organization that were, especially those who were singly isolated by themselves. Mm -hmm. Dr. Amy, would you change any of the conversations or, or help these individuals who are uh, trying to communicate through phone, through um, written messages, is there something that they can do to make those conversations more meaningful to those usually individuals that are isolated? Uh, great question and wonderful work. How fabulous that you're doing that. I just love it. I would say again, having questions that are beyond the what have you eaten, what did you watch on TV, you know, moving to questions that have meaning in people's lives. I think it's one of the best ways to connect. So it can be things from people's past, um, you know, asking them more about their who they've been in their life as well as who they are now, what their hopes and dreams are still. People have hopes and dreams to the day they die. You know, when 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 we get through this, what's your greatest hope that we'll do? What do you, that you want to do? So I think looking for the deeper questions and getting out of the surface questions are one of the best things. And things that can get people thinking for the next phone call. You know, you know what I'd love to talk with you about next time, you know, and having a list of questions like that. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks. You know what, I, I, what, what maybe Jane, what we can do is take some of the questions from my caring cards and put them, the questions up on the IFA website as a, can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. And we can also post the link of your caring cards, which that's we've great. Done. That's great. But the, I just love to give people a few of those questions that they could work with, you know, if they're not able to get the cards, I'd love them to have some of the questions so that they can yeah. work with them. And, and by the way, I, I'd like to tell you where those, where that idea of the caring cards came from. It, it was actually a colleague of mine who had a mom with dementia and she'd go visit her. And when she'd go, she found she was stuck in the same conversations all the time, you know, asking the same things and not very interesting. And so she started writing down questions to ask her mom before she went. And then she'd go and she found that the, her mother was engaging at a different level. And so when we talked about that idea, I told her I thought that was worth really taking out into the world. And my initial thought was people with dementia and it ended up being lots of people. And Kathleen Brasher, who you heard speak earlier today, we had a funny connection when we ran into each other in, uh, Czech Republic, I think we were in Prague, and she had purchased those to talk with her mom and didn't know that that was me. And so she's like, oh, you're the person who did those caring cards, but they're truly not. I, I want to give, uh, a, you know, credit to Kathleen who came up with it, not the Kathleen Brash or another Kathleen who came up with the idea. And I've heard so many positive stories and those cards are just one example. You can sit and make up your own questions. So don't feel like you're, you have to get the caring cards to have great questions. You can come up with questions that are beyond the typical, but that's one of the best things I've seen people do 
to be able to connect and to, to go to a deeper level. And that's what we're all seeking, I think. Again, what COVID has brought out is the idea that we all are seeking connection and that we recognize in this isolation how much we need that connection with each other. So Amy, one question from me before we start moving to wrap up, and it's really about what's happened in COVID in our lives. So, mm -hmm. you know, the slowing down and the stopping, I mean, I know people have sped up. I mean, I've sped up in my work, but slowed down in myself. To mm -hmm. what degree are we mm -hmm. going to be able to take the lessons learned in, you know, because I believe we'll be living with COVID, not post COVID. So mm -hmm. how can we actually translate and transform some of the things that have happened? Well, that's a great question. And boy, I wish we had a couple of hours to get everybody into that conversation because it's such a rich one. I, one of the things that I've recommended to people to do is to actually write down some of what you just said, Jane. What are some of the gifts? Because it, it, it is so easy, I think, when we're going through an experience to think we'll hang on to it, but we need reminders. And so I, I, would, I would throw this out to all of us here, you know, to look at what, have there been gifts in your life during this time? And what are those? And I think the slowing, I loved what you said, Jane, about your work is sped up, but you've slowed down. Mm -hmm. And how do we continue that? How do we continue? Many of us have found more introspection during this time. I think many people have found that they have reached out to people that they maybe had lost connection with. So if, if you can recognize those gifts and actually write them down, it helps commit to taking those forward in your life. I know when I was a caregiver, one of the things I did that really helped me in the very beginning of caregiving for my mom, I wrote down who I wanted to be in that experience and what I wanted to say after my parents had passed about who I was as a caregiver. And for me, that was very profound because I was just starting my doctoral program. And I wrote down that what I wanted to do was put my parents first because I knew the doctoral program was gonna be very intense. And there were choice points during my doctoral program where my mother really had some intense care needs and I ended up taking a semester off or delaying my dissertation and doing some things like that. So it took me longer to get through my doctoral program. But when my parents passed, I, was able, I, I kept that. That was something I looked at all the way through my caregiving. Every so often I'd revisit what I said and it kept me on track. And so I think often just having those moments of introspection where we can write down who do we want to be, how do we take, want to take this forward in the world when we move to, as you say, Jane, not maybe post COVID, but living in the next stage of COVID, we can have something that helps us see, are, are we still living that? Are we still taking that forward with us? Let's not lose the gifts in this as hard as it is. So Amy, do you have a takeaway message for, for the town hall participants this evening today? Well, I think there's two things I would say. One is, because um, I heard so many people echo it in your comments, the idea of listening and listening differently than perhaps we typically do. And, and I, I think, again, the gift of giving someone our presence and our attention is as important as all of our professional expertise. If they don't feel that we're present with them, all of those other things we provide get lost. I think the quality gets lost. So the idea of listening at a different level. And then the other idea that I don't want to lose is the idea that we need to support each other too in this. And I think the more we can have openness about our own struggles through this and, and be vulnerable at a level that feels comfortable, it invites other people to do that too. And it allows us to, to be there for each other in a, in a different way than perhaps we normally have the opportunity to do. So listening and support are the two things I would say. Thanks, thanks very much, Amy. Um, before we close, I, I do wanna reflect on some words that I've written down that you said. And uh, one of the phrases was, we all have hopes and dreams till the day we die. Mm -hmm. So my mum's got them. So, you know, it's about going back and, 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 and asking the question. Life long time is short. Mm. Um, shifting the lens. You know, we must be heard, seen and understood. And the presence and attention to who we are, but also those that we serve and those that we connect with, you know, every day. 
And technology is fantastic, but it actually confuses the conversation when you're looking at that, looking at the screen and also trying to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And it's not only how do I fit, it's where do I fit? Mm. And what do I need to do and how I can change the environment so that I am part of the conversation or enable people to be part of the conversation that I'm in. And so all of those things. I've had a great time being in conversation with you today and I thank you very much for the friendship, for being a great colleague and for doing your work in not only this field, but also wherever you connect around the world. So thank you. Thank you.